Launch ready for WWE Aftershock in 3, 2, 1. World Wrestling Entertainment Discussion is live. You host Owen Finch. What's going on everybody? Welcome to WWE Aftershock Week 36. At least I believe it's week 36, but if it's not week 36, you can just uh, look at the title of the video and that will tell you what it is. But flying solo this week just because um, everybody else is unavailable to do a video this week, so I'm doing this myself. So let's just get right into it. We're going to cover all of the WWE shows for the week and anything news related that I have to report. So let's just get right into it. Um... So we're going to start with War, which took place on September 4th, 2023. It was the Labor Day edition of Monday Night War, but they didn't do anything to really um, talk about it. So um, The show was commentated by Wade Barrett and Michael Cole, and we have an intro. We have a new intro for War now. Everything except for NXT... Uh, Love a Lop and Main Event had a new intro, so both Raw and SmackDown, which, uh, I like the new intros, you know, I like that they change it up every so often, um, it made sense, considering the fact that, you know, Jey Uso just recently moved over from, uh, SmackDown to Raw, so they had to change that, and, um, I'm pretty sure there's been some other significant changes on SmackDown, you know, the Street Profits and Bobby Lashley being a faction now, and all that stuff, so... Yeah, it was uh, a nice change of pace. Um, Wall actually kicked off. We had, uh, I think I did. I already said it way better than Michael Cole in commentary, but I'll just say it again just in case I didn't. And yeah, it kicked off with Jey Uso. This is uh, the first thing you saw. It made sense because uh, it was a pretty big thing that happened. And yeah, Jey Uso comes out. And he basically talked about, you know, why he's on Raw now. Talked about how... Uh, you know, he was going to quit and just, you know, not wrestle anymore, but then he got a call from Cody Rhodes and management to be on Raw, and he thanks Cody in a way for looking out for him, and he realizes that he's made a lot of enemies, um, you know, uh, when he was in the bloodline and stuff, but he said that, you know, he doesn't expect things to happen overnight, uh, but he realizes that, uh, you know, he's willing to lo looking forward to the challenge. And the first person that confronts him um, is Sami Zayn. This made a lot of sense considering the, the history together. And Sami Zayn basically just says that he's proud of Jey Uso for finally breaking away from the bloodline and Roman Reigns and everything like that. And he go uh, says that, you know, we're not going to ha have the greatest relationship, but uh, he shows his support to Jey Uso. And he goes for a handshake. But he doesn't take the handshake, and it looks like at first it's gonna, uh, that it's going to be awkward. But then Jay tells Sammy that that wasn't very oozy of him, and they hug. And they walk backstage together. And then following this, uh, Drew McIntyre and Matt Widow come out, uh, and they don't look happy to see uh, Jay Uso on Raw now. And Sammy Zayn kind of has to talk them down a little bit. So this continued throughout the night. Um, we saw Jey Uso throughout the show, um, we find out, um, let me just make sure I have everything correct here, uh, there's a lot of things that happen on Raw, actually, um, but yeah, he was backstage later on, and, um, Adam Pearce revealed that SmackDown's going to get compensated for the trade they made within the next few weeks, and that the people backstage may not be happy with who that trade's going to be, which is probably going to end up being Cody Rhodes. I think it's this is going to be how Cody Rhodes goes from Raw to SmackDown, where he can get his match with uh, the Tribal Chief for the WWE Undisputed uh, Universal Championship, so that makes a lot of sense. And, um, yeah... That led to later on Dominic Mysterio confronted Jey Uso and basically offered him a spot in Judgment Day. So it looks like we're going to get a match between Jey Uso and Dominic Mysterio, which 
I actually think makes a lot of sense. Um, I don't think it would be for necessarily the North American Championship, but we'll have to wait and see on that. Uh, but all in all, I enjoyed everything that they did with Jey Uso throughout the show, kind of uh, interweaving him into the um, into the show and everything like that. So I enjoyed uh, all that stuff. And um, we had our first actual match on the show. It was a Tornado Tag Team match. It was Drew McIntyre and Matt Riddle versus the Viking Raiders. Uh, it was absolutely awesome match. I thought it was uh, very good stuff. Uh, eventually, um, the uh, Kofi Kingston runs out to even the odds, and the Viking Raiders throw Kingston into McIntyre, and then they hit Radnor Rock through a table onto Matt Riddle, and uh, yeah, they end up winning the match. But yeah, it was very good stuff, a very good brawl. And later in the night, Drew McIntyre confronted Matt Riddle. He wasn't happy. He, he's not happy that Jey Uso's on Raw, but he's not happy with how everything's going down. And he basically accuses Kofi Kinson of doing this on purpose. So uh, I think this is setting up slowly to a heel turn with uh, Drew McIntyre uh, turning heel, uh, which I think uh, uh, is very necessary, and I'm happy that that's going to happen. So everything uh, I, they did with Drew McIntyre on the show, I enjoyed. I imagine we're going to get that triple threat tag match with all these teams. Um, and then uh, who, uh, Drew and Riddle won't win. And that will be when Drew finally snaps on Riddle. I think we'll get that maybe uh, on an episode of Raw, maybe the Go Home Week, or uh, the show following Fastlane, or maybe we'll just get that at Fastlane itself. So, it would be interesting. Um, then... Um, yeah, uh, Seth Rollins then comes out to cut a promo. We find out that Seth Rollins is there, and um, Adam Pearce doesn't want him there uh, because uh, he thinks he needs to be looking out for himself because uh, he's not medically cleared to really be there because of all the damage he took at uh, Payback. But Seth says that he wants to be there. He's talking to Ricochet, and Ricochet is trying to tell Seth that he doesn't have to, um, you know, uh, hold down the fort. And... Um, yeah, uh, Seth goes out there, he calls out Shinsuke Nakamura to face him for the World Heavyweight Championship, and they did a video earlier where Shinsuke Nakamura did a promo talking about how he exposed the back of Seth Rollins and how Seth Rollins got in a lucky shot, and Seth challenged Nakamura to have a rematch for the World Heavyweight Championship, um, tonight, and Nakamura didn't want to have it, so Seth fought, went and took the fight to Nakamura, they brawled around, and eventually Ricochet uh, intervenes, and it leads to a match between Ricochet and Shinsuke Nakamura. Um, it didn't really make sense that Damian Priest was watching this match from backstage, since none of these guys are the champs, but whatever. Um, and yeah, they had a very good match. Uh, they did a DQ finish where Nakamura took out uh, Ricochet with a steel chair. He just beat him up. And I, I didn't really like that finish. I think they should have just had Nakamura just beat him. And then if you wanted to have him attack him afterwards, that would have been fine. And Seth Rollins came out again. And they had they had another pull-up pop wall. Eventually, Nakamura got the better of him. So Ricochet chased him off with a chair. And it looks like they're going to continue this feud between Seth Rollins and Shinsuke Nakamura. I imagine they're going to do a number one contenders match. Maybe not next week, but on the following episode of War where... Um, Nakamura will face Ricochet and become number one contender that way, and then that's how you get the rematch between Seth and Nakamura. And I think this time there'll be a stipulation match for it, so that would be good stuff. Um, and then uh, doing this too, uh, Pierce reprimanded Nakamura and stuff for being there and all that type of stuff, so that was good stuff. Um, they did an interview with Zoe Stark where she talked about how she was sick and tired of having to carry dead weight of Trish Stratus, and she wasn't getting appreciated for it. And Shayna Baszler came up to her and basically talked about how they both had to carry dead weight. And uh, basically, that leads to a match happening. And we got that match later in the night, Shayna Baszler versus Zoe Stark. It was very good, uh, very competitive. And uh, Shayna Baszler made uh, Zoe Stark tap out with the Karafuda Clutch. And this was after she had tried to fight out of it a couple times. And afterwards, uh, Shayna Baszler uh, showed respect towards uh, Zoe Stark. So I don't know if they're going to do a team between these two or what. But Zoe Stark looks like is definitely a babyface now, which 
um, I think could be pretty interesting. So overall, I was pretty interested in all this type of stuff. So it's good stuff. Um, they did a promo segment with Judgment Day where they bragged about uh, having all the gold and everything like that. And then uh, J.D. McDonough came out and he talked about how um, he deserves his flowers for helping Judgment Day win. And he admits... Uh, he tells basically Damian Priest that he has to get rid of the Money in the Bank briefcase. And we at first we're thinking he should cash in. Because earlier it showed that after Seth had been laid out, uh, Damian Priest was thinking of cashing in. And then um, Rhea Ripley told him not tonight, which I didn't really get because it was the perfect opportunity for Damian Priest to cash in. And she told him not to take it, so I didn't really understand that. Um, but... Uh, we first, I thought that he was going to have to vacate it or something, but Damien, uh, Jaden McDonough gave him a new contract. It's a Judgment Day style Money in the Bank briefcase that has uh, senior uh, Money in the Bank on it now, and Damien Priest has that briefcase. They did a thing on the exclusive where Damien Priest put his contract into that briefcase, and it looks like they're just going to use the old Money in the Bank briefcase as like a weapon now, pretty much. So, um,. Sami Zayn came out. We find out that Kevin Owens isn't there due to the uh, match that he had the night before. And uh, he talked about how it took uh, five guys pretty much for uh, Judgment Day to beat, uh, finally win the WWE Undisputed Tag Team titles from Kevin Owens and Sami Zayn. And he challenges Dominic Mysterio to a match, but then it leads to JD McDonough uh, getting a match with him instead. And throughout the night, Finn Balor was trying to convince um, Judge, uh, Judgment Day, the Judgment Day members to let J.D. McDonough into Judgment Day. And they said that he's going to prove himself first. So we, we got that match. It was Sami Zayn versus J.D. McDonough. And they had a really good match. And eventually, Dominic Mysterio interferes. It leads to J.D. McDonough beating him with a roll-up. And afterwards, he beats up Dom and J.D. McDonough, and it looked like he's going to hit the Huluva kick on Dom, but J.D. McDonough makes the save, and Sami Zayn lays him up with the Huluva kick, but Dominic Mysterio doesn't make the save. So, I'm pretty interested to see what they're doing with J.D. McDonough when it comes to whether or not he's going to join uh, Judgment Day. So, yeah, all of this stuff with Judgment Day they did throughout the show I thought worked for me. And I think eventually he is going to join Judgment Day. Um... And it might lead to some more um, dissension in Judgment Day where, you know, um, it leads to kind of Damien Priest really not agreeing with him and all that type of stuff. So, it would be good stuff. Um, yeah, and also in this show where Cal Rodriguez had a backstage segment with Adam Pearce where it looked like they were talking about something. And Chelsea Green came in. We find out that Piper Niven isn't medically cleared. So, uh... Chelsea Green didn't want to hear the fact that the women's tag team championships were cursed, and Adam Pearce put the blame thinking that Chelsea Green was the one that was cursed, and then she was talking shit to, um, about Raquel Rodriguez, so it led to a match between them getting made, where Raquel Rodriguez won fairly easily, and then, um, yeah, uh, afterwards it's revealed that Raquel Rodriguez is gonna get a rematch for the women's world championship against Rhea Ripley on the next episode of Monday Night Raw, uh, where if where Dominic Mysterio is banned from inside, so uh, overall that was relatively fine stuff. This was probably the weakest end of the show with the Raquel Rodriguez versus Chelsea Green match, but I think it's time to scrap the women's tag team championships. Uh, there's really no reason to have them anymore. It just seems like every time any anyone gets any momentum with those championships, um. It's either squandered via just kind of bad booking or injuries. And it looks like that's kind of what's happening here. So, yeah, I think it's time to scrap, scrap those championships. Um, and then, uh, yeah, the last real big thing that happened before the main event angle was uh, we had Miz TV with uh, what we thought was going to be his guest, John Cena. But it wasn't John Cena. It was an invisible John Cena where they kind of played up to the whole you can't see me thing where the Miz basically just punked him out and everything like that. I really thought this was funny. I thought Miz played up to this really well. And, but the biggest thing that came out of this was the Miz challenge LA Knight to a rematch. Uh, where it, this time there's no special guest referees or anything like that. But this was pretty funny stuff. I thought it was funny. Um, 
Another big thing that happened in the show was Tommaso Ciampa looked like he had some type of secret meeting with Adam Pearce. So I don't know what this is leading for with Tommaso Ciampa, whether it's him getting a future title shot. Maybe it's leading to Johnny Gargano coming back when reforming DIY, which I hope so. So uh, interesting stuff. And the main event angle was Chad Gable versus uh, Walter for the Intercontinental Championship. It main evented the show, which I'm happy about. Um, I thought this was a big enough thing to main event war. And I thought it was something different, finally, uh, than having the typical Judgment Day segment in the main event of the show. So, overall, I was a fan of that. Um, and, uh, yeah, uh, Chad Gable had his family inside, and they did this thing throughout the night where it showed past uh, Intercontinental Champions throughout the show. It just kind of showed pictures of them. And these two just really put on a clinic uh, on the show. It was a great match, really back and forth. Just really go watch it. Uh, Chad Gable nearly uh, wins the match on several occasions, but it's not to be. Uh, Walter finally uh, hits a power bomb followed by a clothesline on Gable for the win, and he didn't officially become it on this show, but as of Thursday, he officially is now the longest reign and intercontinental champion of all time, which I think is, is totally valid for Walter to have this accolade. He's done a lot for this championship. He probably might be the, just the greatest Intercontinental Champion of all time, uh, just with the body of work that he's had with this title reign, um, with the matches he's been putting out with uh, the Triple Threat at Mania, the match at Clash of the Castro, and the match with Drew at SummerSlam. So uh, overall, yeah, just a fantastic uh, decision here to have him break the record. And I love the fact that he doesn't really even seem like that he cares that he's even breaking the record. He just wants to make his own legacy type of thing. So... Yeah, this was a great decision here. He got so far anyways, it really wouldn't have made sense if he didn't break the record. And I hope this isn't just it for Chad Gable. I kind of hope they give him something else, a substance, whether that's eventually be maybe the guy to dethrone Walter for the Intercontinental Championship, or maybe uh, Alpha Academy ends up being the tag team that dethrones Judgment Day of the uh, WWE Undisputed Tag Team Championships. You know, I kind of hope they kind of keep Gable in the limelight just because uh, I think he's done great stuff. I would have complained if they made him a future opponent for Seth Rollins for the World Heavyweight Championship. Just keep Gable in the conversation. I think that'd be great stuff. So, yeah, overall, that was Raw. Uh, I thought Raw was a fantastic show. I'm going to give it an A-. I thought it was very uh, uh, very awesome. I liked, uh, you know, about everything on it. Really not a bad thing on Raw. The weakest thing, I, again, like I said, was probably the uh, Raquel Rodriguez uh, Chelsea Green match, but overall, everything on Raw, I thought, uh, really clicked. So, overall, good stuff that happened on Raw. Um, and I'm just going to cover main event now, because that's basically the dog show of Raw. I was going to cover that first, but I forgot to, so let me just find my notes for that real quick. Um, yeah, that took place on September 6, 2023. It was taped the same day as Raw, though. Uh, the commentary team for that was Byron Saxon and Wade Barrett. Relatively solid episode of main event here. Bronson Reed beat Akira Tozawa, but they did give Tozawa a nice uh, hope spot where it looked like he could have won, where he does hit the senton, but uh, Bronson Reed just barely manages to kick out. So, relatively nice little match right there. And then we had the main event, which was uh, Tommaso Ciampa versus Riddick Moss. Probably the best match I've ever seen Riddick Moss ever have. Um, but overall, this was relatively good stuff. Ciampa won with the fairy tale ending, which I'm happy that happened. But overall, uh, I thought that main event was relatively good. I'll give that like a B minus. I thought we had a couple of uh, good matches on there. So relatively good episode of main event this week. Um, and then, yeah, let's just go through NXT. Um, so, yeah. Um, main, um, NXT took place on September 5th, 2023. We had Booker T and Vic Joseph on commentary for that. Um... Still a relatively good episode of NXT, but this was definitely the weakest one in a while. Um, this episode of NXT really could have been a great episode if it wasn't for booking. Um, but um, let's just go through it. Um, it, kicked, it kicked off with the NXT Women's Championship match between Tiffany Stratton defending the belt against Keanu James. Bad match. Not a good decision to have this be your NXT Women's title match. Just really not good. Um, fans could have cared less about this. None of the women got an entrance, which isn't always a bad thing, but it's a title match, and that's simply not a good sign. 
if they didn't get an entrance that we just saw already in the win. The match didn't last very long, but it was still uh, long enough for it to be a bad match. And I think the fans really didn't know who to root for just because, uh, you know, um, both of them are heels and have the same, relatively kind of the same gimmick. Uh, and there was botched stuff that, spots in this match. Tiffany Stratton thankfully won with the moonsault. I mean, I say thankfully, but there's really, really wasn't a good outcome of who was going to win this match. It really, um, it was really slim pickings. But following this, Becky Lynch came on the screen and announced, you know, that she wanted to challenge for the NXT Women's title since that's the only title that she has won. So she's going to come uh, next Tuesday to face uh, Tiffany Stratton for the belt. And it led to several interviews where Tiffany Stratton, you know, at first she didn't respond, but then it revealed that um, she's the top star in NXT and everything like that. So, yeah, they're doing that match. Um, I hope Becky just wins the belt next week. I could see them doing something where they do a disqualification, but they say it's going to be the main event. I would really hope they give the belt to Becky Lynch, just because I think that will do, uh, be really strong in the ratings and everything like that. And I think the the women's division is probably the weakest division in NXT, uh, probably in all of WWE in general, um, maybe except the tag division, I guess, in WWE. But um, I think uh, it's a necessary step for... Uh, Becky Lynch to win that title. And we do know what's going to come with Keanu James next. She did go into the locker room and rant about it, and it looks like her and Roxanne Perez are going to feud now because they got into a ball. Not a fan of that. Um, I guess it gives Roxanne Perez something to do, but I don't I don't think this is a good direction for Roxanne Perez. I kind of hope they have like a couple-week feud, and then they kind of move on, and maybe she's the one that ends up facing Becky Lynch. I know Mercy for the belt, but we'll have to wait and see on that. But... Overall, uh, relatively, uh, good stuff. Um, so, yeah, uh, yeah, um, good, good stuff there. So, um, I'm just gonna send a text real quick, because I keep getting called. And I'm just, just yeah. Um... But yeah, continuing um, with NXT. Um, let me just continue. Where is NXT? Okay. Um, yeah, they did a thin throughout the show with uh, Carmelo Hayes, where he was backstage, um, and he got he had like a little face to face uh, altercation with Wesley. And before that, before anything else happens with the NXT title program, um, Ilya Dragunov faced Or Mensa. And uh, it was pretty competitive, pretty good stuff. Or, um, Ilya Dragunov ended up winning. And um, Wesley confronted him and basically told Ilya Dragunov that he wants to have the first shot at the NXT title against um, Carmelo mm -hmm. Hayes. And he says he'll give him a shot when... Um, you know, uh, he wins the title, he'll get the first opportunity, and then, um, yeah, um, uh, Carmelo Hayes came out and revealed, because Ilya Dragunov wanted to be the one to, fa uh, to face Carmelo Hayes, and Carmelo Hayes came out, and he revealed pretty much that there is no asterisk towards his victories against those two, but if they both feel like they want a title match, uh, next week they're gonna have a match where, uh, the winner will become number one contender for his title at No Mercy. So, I'm looking forward to seeing that match. I think that'll be good stuff. And backstage, Ilya Dragunov confronted Trick Williams, and he basically gave him his props. Uh, you know, he complimented him on the victory, and um, then he, uh, yeah, he complimented him on the victory, and then um, he basically just. Uh, Realized that uh, he basically pointed out the fact that Trick Limbs doesn't think that Carmelo Hayes can beat him. So, yeah, all of us all, I enjoyed everything they did with the NXT Championship picture on this show. Um, they did several segments backstage with Diamond Mind where this basically was just kind of, let's just have all the tag teams have a segment together where everybody got into a fight and everything like that. It led to them wanting to challenge for the belts. And, yeah, all the tag teams came in, Blake and Anolfe, uh, Blanco Lima and Lucian Price, um, 
Hanky Tanky, and uh, yeah, basically every tag team just kind of came in there. Eventually, the place just gets destroyed, and the biggest team that came in was in there was Angel Garza and Humberto Carrillo. They brawled with uh, Stax and uh, Tony D'Angelo, so that might be the team that they face at No Mercy for the belts. Uh, of all this, though, for some reason, the match that gets made official for next week is Idris and Ophi and Malik Blade versus the Creed Brothers. So, kind of interesting right there. Um, but, yeah, these segments were hit and miss. Some of them were good, some of them weren't good, but, yeah. I still think they missed an opportunity to call the Creed Brothers up to the main roster. I don't know why they didn't just, just didn't do that, but whatever. Um, and... They did some stuff with Dominic Mysterio, um, with him being the ref and everything for the North NXT North American Championship number one contenders match. Uh, it showed him reading the book of the rules, and he was just kind of ripping him up. And, yeah, in the number one contenders match between Dragon Lee and Mustafa Ali, uh, he was the guest referee for it. And he started off calling, down the, calling the match down the middle, but then eventually yeah, he did a relatively slow count towards Dragon Lee, which distracts him long enough for Mustafa Ali to get a wall up on him, and uh, Dominic Mysterio fast counted him, and um, Mustafa Ali won, which means he's going to face Dominic Mysterio for the NXT North American Championship at No Mercy. Afterwards, he uh, laid out, um, he got, Mustafa Ali uh, punched him in the face, and yeah, I like how they went about all this, it, ke it keeps Dragon Lee in the conversation to have an NXT North American title match, and, um, you know, it keeps, uh, you know, um, and, you know, you get to that match. Um, I assume, um, they're just gonna have Mustafa Ali just be, uh, relatively babyface. They are doing things with him anyways to slowly turn him heel, but I think he's gonna be the de facto babyface just because Dominic Mysterio gets so much hate, so, yeah. Uh, overall, that was relatively good stuff. Um... They did some NXT uh, Global Heritage Cup uh, matches. Nathan Fraser got interviewed, and he talked about how everyone's telling him to slow down, but he doesn't want to slow down, so there you go. Uh, he faced um, Duke Hudson in a Global Heritage Cup match, and they had a really good match. He ended up winning, so he got two points. Um, he's officially on the board now. And then Pete Dunn faced Axiom. Uh, they had a really excited match, uh, very back and forth. Eventually, uh, it was a tie. Nobody won, so Axiom gets a point, and Pete Dunne gets a point. And afterwards, uh, Tyler Bate came out and had a face-off, and he's still yet to have a match in the Heritage Cup Invitational. He did have a match on this show, though, however. He beat Tyler Cato in a match, which I thought was a great decision. Um, made him look really strong, so I'm glad that, um, I'm glad that happened. So... Everything they did with the Global Heritage Cup was a thumbs up for me for NXT. I thought I'm, I'm looking at the matches so far. Um, and then th some I didn't like on this show was uh, the pairing with JC Jane and Thea Hale. Thea Hale is totally gonna go heel. She's pretty much almost there. She's not quite there yet, but she's pretty much almost a heel. Um, Gigi Dolan confronted her and tried to warn her about. Uh, Teaming up with JC Jane, pretty much. And it led to uh, Blad Davenport coming in and having a face-off with her. And it led to a match between Gigi Dolan and Thea Hale later in the night. Where Thea Hale won via Blad Davenport interference. So it looks like now we're going to get Gigi Dolan versus Blad Davenport in a feud. I'm just not a fan of how any of these people, maybe except for Blad Davenport, are being used. It seems like Gigi Dolan just loses all the time and... I'm not a fan of this tag team coming up between uh, Thea Hale and JT Jane. I'm just not a fan of that. So, yeah, none of this really worked for me. Um, what else happened on this show? Um, let's see. Uh, Drew Gulak, Charlie Dempsey, and Damon Kemp confronted Miles Bourne about teaming with um, Briggs and Jensen uh, next week. And he said that he's just looking for an opportunity and basically they tell him to stay in his lane and all that type of stuff. So uh, I think that six-man tag, tag, tag team match could be pretty exciting. And then, um, yeah, um, uh, the other stuff that happened on this show, um, they did a segment with 
um, Kalani Jordan and um, Lila Valkyria backstage where Kalani Jordan was looking for advice from her. And Dana Brooke took exception to that, so that's going to be a match next week now. So not excited about that. Um, nobody cares about Dana Brooke, and I don't care about Dana Brooke. So, um, yeah. And then, yeah, that was basically everything that happened on NXT, except for the main event, obviously. Uh, main event was uh, Braun Breaker versus Vaughn Wagner with Mrs. Stone in the no DQ match with Baron Corbin on commentary for it. Um... And Baron Corbin basically gave his prediction, but he said that he didn't care. So, he was on commentary. The match was really good, very exciting, very physical. Um, but Braun Breaker won. He had a low blow on his spear and beat Von Wagner. Not a good decision here. This, I think, was Von Wagner's match to win. Um, I didn't really get why they had him lose here. It'd be one thing, maybe, if they had Baron Corbin interfere on Von Wagner's behalf, e either inadvertently or totally on purpose. But... Um, he just beat him clean, and the thing, the thing that sucks the most about it is Braun Breaker went through, like, the stage, and he got put through the table, but yet all that happened to Von Wagner was a low blow and a spear, and this is supposed to be a big monster, so I don't really understand, uh, any of that. Then afterwards, they had Braun Breaker completely wipe him out, he hit him in the back with a chair, and then he grabbed the steps, and he used the steps, and basically the screen went black, and it was as if... It was, he was supposed to be completely wiped out and everything like that. Uh, and he got stretched out and everything. So it looks like they like, wrote off on Wagner for a little bit. So, yeah, not a fan of this. Um, just not good. Um, I didn't mind the match. I just didn't like the result and everything like that. They're trying to give sympathy to Von Wagner when everyone already likes him pretty much. So, yeah, I think you had a good episode of NXT this week. It's just the booking of was really not that good. So I'm still going to give it a B-. minus. There was still stuff that was relatively liked on this show. I just would have changed some things booking-wise on this show. So that was NXT. Uh, I'll just cover Level Up right now since that, uh, that that's included. That's taped the same day as NXT. Uh, you had a few um, good matches on it on Level Up. Um, we had Tavion Heights versus Ikiman Giro. That was a good match. Tavion Heights actually won, which I'm happy about. I'm hoping they can get him doing something on NXT relatively soon. Um, maybe I would I would put him in that faction with Drew Gulak, Charlie Dempsey, and uh, Damon Kemp. I think that could be a good utilization for him. Maybe make that like some type of big faction. So I think that'd be good stuff. Um, and then Common Petrovic got interviewed and talked about you know how she's not really used to losing, but to become a success, you have to learn how to deal with defeat first. And she faced Fallon Henley on the show and didn't beat Fallon Henley. But overall, I'm enjoying Carmen Petrovic right now. I think uh, out of uh, all of the that crop of talent that Kalani Jordan... Kalani Jordan's probably the best one. But my um, Carmen Petrovic's probably been, you know, relatively consistent. I think once she finds a gimmick, uh, she'll be good. Um, and then the main event was a... NXT Global Heritage Cup match. It was, uh, well, not match, but the Global Invitational. Um, it was Joe Coffey versus Akira Tozawa. They had a relatively excited match. It was very physical, very good. And Joe Coffey won, which means now he has four points in the tournament, and Tozawa still has zero. So I think he's got one more match left, they said, in the tournament. He's supposed to face Duke Hudson, and I think he's actually going to end up going undefeated in the tournament. And he's going to make it to, um, you know, that group, and then he'll face. I'm not really sure who we even faced yet. So, there's still a bit of ways away. So, yeah, Level Up I thought was relatively good. I'll give that a B-. minus. I thought uh, they had some good matches on that show. And, uh, yeah, I think having the Heritage Cup matches is actually kind of helping. The Global Invitation, having some of the matches happen on Level Up is kind of helping Level Up a little bit because it kind of makes you, it gives Level Up a purpose at least for the moment. So, I like the fact that they're doing that. I mean, I think they have to do it that way anyways just because they don't have the time to... Um, get all the matches on NXT, but it is what it is. So overall, level up I thought was relatively good. Um, I'll do some quick predictions uh, for this ep coming episode of NXT. We have a few matches announced. Um, I'll do some for Raw after I do NXT because I forgot. Um, so Wesley's gonna face Eli Dragonoff, where the winner becomes number one contender. Um, I imagine 
Uh, this really could go either way, actually. I hope they don't do a double finish where um, they do a double DQ or whatever. But I think uh, the best bet is um, for... Um, I think they should just give the win to probably Ely Dragon off. They still could come back to Wesley. I hope they don't turn him heel out of it. But they still could come back to Wesley um, becoming the champion. Or at least contending for it again. But I think Ilya Dragon off the story right now. And I think that he, um, he might go heel. It look, um, I keep thinking that he is. But, um, yeah, I think they're going to give it to Ilya Dragunov. And I think the match when uh, Wesley and Ilya Dragunov... Or not Wesley. When Carmelo Hayes and Ilya Dragunov face off in their rematch. I think this time there's going to be like a stipulation. like Maybe like a cage match. Or maybe um, maybe a last man standing match. I'd like to see that. Um, some, some type of match where like there can't be like an asterisk maybe to it uh, this time. Um, maybe Hell in a Cell, um, you know, because NXT still has yet to do a Hell in a Cell match. Um, there's other matches announced for NXT. We're going to get, uh, the Creed Brothers versus, uh, Adrian Sanofi and Malik Blade. Um, I'm thinking the Creed Brothers will win. It's the first match back in NXT, and I think they're going to get a win. Um, so, uh, I think they're going to get the win there. Um, we have Briggs, Jensen, and Miles Bourne versus... Um, Drew Gulak, Damon Kemp, and Charlie Dempsey. Um, if I had to make a prediction, um, I'm thinking that, um, they're going to give the win to Drew Gulak's team. Um, I think Miles Bourne is mainly in the match just to take the loss, and I think they need to build that faction up. I think that faction could be something really good in NXT, but they need to get, they need to get some wins, so. We're going to get a couple more NXT Heritage Cup matches. I'm not sure what they are. I'm just going to guess. I think... We're going to get... We, they've been doing two groups. Um, so I think in Group B, we're going to get uh, Joe Coffey versus Duke Hudson. And I think Joe Coffey will win that. I think he's going to go undefeated in his block. Um, so I think Joe Coffey will win that. And then um, I think we're getting Tyler Bate versus Axiom. Uh, since this is Tyler Bate's first match in the um, Global Invitational, I think Tyler Bate will get the win there. Um, so there's that. Um, I think the only other matches left is they have to do Pete Dunne versus Tyler Bate. They have to do Charlie Dempsey versus Tyler Bates. Um, basically all the Tyler Bates matches. And I think the only match left in Group B is I think they have to do Akira Tozawa versus Nathan Frazier. I imagine they're doing that match on level up. If they do that match on level up, I think Nathan Frazier will win. Unfortunately, I think Tozawa is going to basically uh, get go into the Heritage Cup without a win, which I think sucks for him, but it is what it is. Um... So that's basically all the predictions for NXT. Going through some predictions for War. Um, we have some matches announced. We have Rhea Ripley versus Raquel Rodriguez for the Women's World Title. I think Rhea Ripley retains. I don't think there's any doubt that Raquel Rodriguez is getting the belt. And I think they're going to set up Rhea Ripley's next feud. I'm not sure who that could be with. Um, maybe they'll bring back Liv Morgan. I'm not sure. Um, and then... Cody Rhodes is supposed to be, uh, make a return. This is going to be the first time we've seen him on TV since uh, the trade. I'm not sure what he's going to talk about. Uh, maybe this is going to be where it, it gets announced that he was the guy that's going to be traded over to SmackDown. So this will be like his last Raw uh, before then. And then Walter is supposed to have a um, Intercontinental Championship celebration to celebrate his long, the longest reign in Intercontinental title reign. Um, I assume he'll just have a celebration and is going to get interrupted by somebody and it will set up his next feud for the Intercontinental Championship. Um, as for who that could be with, um, I'm not sure. I don't think, I think the Gable thing should be done, at least temporarily. Um, they could do, they have a lot of options. They could do, uh, Ciampa. Uh, they could have someone get caught up and face him, but, uh, um, the person I would like to see, honestly, would, would be Bronson Reed. I think that I think that would be an awesome match there for the IC title. But um, the person I think that should probably face uh, Walter next would be Ciampa. I think that, I think you could do a lot of um, with that. Um, and then you know um, you could have uh, you can use that to set up um, Johnny Gargano coming back, and uh, that can be how DIY reforms and they feud with. Fabian Agnew and Marcel Bartel and have a couple tag matches with them and everything like that. So um, I would do Ciampa, and then that's how you could bring back. You could slowly use that to bring back Johnny Gargano. So that'd be good stuff. Um, so that, I, th I think that's everything on Raw. I can't really think of another match that's announced or anything like that. So uh, let's just continue talking about uh, the weekly uh, WWE content. 
we had the we had an episode of the bump this week, um, and yeah, it was uh, relatively good stuff. Um, let me get my notes up for that. Um, that was uh, that aired on September sixth, two thousand twenty three. We had the hosts Megan Morant, Matt Camp, and Ryan Popola. Uh, they did an intro. Nothing really happened there. Uh, they broke down the week of WWE, kind of everything that happened and everything like that. And uh, Jackie Redman interviewed Finn Balor and Damian Priest. They didn't really say anything new here. They just kind of talked about um, some more stuff that we already knew, like them winning the tag titles, them being together on Judgment Day, talking about Dominic Mysterio because this was the one-year mark when uh, he joined Judgment Day. And they talked about what they look forward to doing now that they're the tag champs and everything like that. And then they played this game about which member of the Judgment Day does this sort of thing. Like, sends the most texts, spends the most time on their phones and everything like that. So, uh, relatively good interview there with Finn Balor and Damian Priest. Then they brought in Kazim um, Famured. I don't know how they say his last name, but he basically... Um, just broke down payback and just kind of talked about everything that's going on there and talked about Walter being the longest reign and intercontinental champion. And then Tiffany Stratton got interviewed. She talked about her time with the NXT Women's Championship. Uh, looking forward to facing Becky Lynch. And basically she just talked about what music and stuff she's into and it did, did kind of a Twitter Q&A. So that interview was actually pretty good. I actually thought Tiffany Stratton was fairly good in that interview. So uh, there you go. Overall, the bump was uh, really good. I'll give it like a solid B. I thought we had a really solid episode of the bump. Uh, I liked the interview mainly with the Judgment Day. I would definitely recommend uh, checking that out. So it's good stuff. Um, and then we have SmackDown. Um, I went to SmackDown uh, this week. Um, I think this is the first SmackDown I've been to since the episode where Vince retired. Um... I can't think of another one I've really been to because I uh, the only other shows I went to were Survivor Series, War Games, um, War. I went to War, uh, the one with John Cena returned, and then I th I think I went to another. I, th I don't think I've been to another WWE show since because they haven't been there hasn't been one here. So um, I'm just gonna go through my pictures because uh, that's how I did the notes this week. Um, not really an eventful. Like, trip going in, to, to, um, it was just kind of, I left my house, we drove to the venue, uh, we had parking um, underneath TD Garden, pretty much, um, because there's a parking garage underneath, we went to our seats, I got the LA Night t-shirt, I got the one that says, let me talk to you, you can look it up on WWShop.com, and then we got some food, uh, we sat at our seats, the show started at 7.45, because they did a dog match, and the dog match was... Kaylee Ray and Isla Dawn versus Meech and Mia Yim and Zelina Vega. Um, good stuff. Zelina Vega got a huge pop when she came out. Um, and uh, Mia Yim and Zelina Vega won when uh, Zelina Vega hit a code red. I believe it was on Isla Dawn for the win. And M M Mia Yim and Zelina Vega won. But yeah, Zelina Vega was really over on this show. Uh not sure why, but I guess maybe it's because LWO is over, but she was really over on this show. Um, so that was cool. Um, and yeah, uh, that was a pretty good tag match. I'll give that like three stars. Uh, uh, poor Kaylee Ray and Isla Dawn, though, they get caught up from NXT, and it doesn't seem like they've done anything really with them since then. So. And then SmackDown started. My seats... Um, were close. We we were pretty much in Lodge 20. Uh, so it was kind of like right where the entrances are. You couldn't see them come out just because of the set of SmackDowns different than Raw. And um, we were right near the Pyro. And I think the Pyro was louder this time than I think it ever has been. Because I've sat there before and I've heard Pyro and it's not been that loud. I think the Pyro was really loud um, th this time around. I'm not sure why that was the case. But, um, yeah, it kicked off, um, with a tag match, uh, after they showed recaps and everything like that, with Charlotte Flair and Io Sky versus, um, Bailey and Io Sky. No. 
I got that one. It's Charlotte Flair and Shotzi versus Bailey and Eosky. Uh, that wouldn't have made sense if Eosky was on both members' teams. Um, yeah, relatively good tag match there. It was uh, pretty good. Um, pretty fun match to watch live. And then that sucked is if somebody stood on the stage, you couldn't see them uh, just because of where our seats were, but it is what it is. Eventually, um, Asuka's in the crowd, and um, she interferes, and she's uh, taunting uh, with the championship, and this distracts Io Sky long enough for Shotzi to hit the um, like an implant DDT on her for the win. And then um, afterwards... Um, E uh, Eosky and Oscar had a face off, and yeah, that was pretty much it. So it was good stuff. I was gonna go through my pictures just because uh, that's how I took notes, like I said before. So I remember that happened. Um, let me just go through my pictures. I took a decent amount of photos. Um, let's see. They did a segment backstage with Paul Heyman and Jimmy Uso, and Jimmy Uso came up, and he was happy to, um, he said he's, he wants to be back in the fold with the bloodline, and Paul Heyman says that, you know, um, he's gonna do what he can, but, like, Solo doesn't know if he wants to win, and, you know, Roma doesn't want to win, but tonight you need to take care of AJ Styles, and then when he walked off, Paul Heyman tells AJ Styles that he should be focusing, because he ran into him. Uh, more on what happened with um, on his own family versus getting involved in bloodline business and AJ Styles attacked him and then Jimmy Uso made the save and he threw him around and everything like that so uh, that was decent stuff I thought that was good um, and then we got a segment with Damage Control where they were upset that they lost their six woman tag match pretty much uh, so that was good stuff there then we had LA Knight versus Austin Theory with Grayson Waller inside. And everyone, LA Knight really is over. It was, uh, he's very over here. Um, and, um, yeah. Um, him and Grayson Waller and Austin Theory went back and forth at each other on the mic. They had the match. Uh, really good match. Uh, I would probably, the t woman's tag, by the way, I would give like three and a quarter stars. It's pretty good. This match I thought was really good live. I gave it three and a half stars. Uh, Grayson Waller was on commentary for this match. Uh, the commentators for SmackDown, by the way, were uh, Corey Graves, Kevin Patrick, and Michael Cole. Obviously, I didn't say that in the beginning because I forgot there were commentators since I didn't hear them. Um, and, yeah, it was really good stuff. Grayson Waller tried to expose the buckle, and LA Knight, uh, you know, eventually was able to avoid that, and he hit the blood force trauma on Theory for the win, and he also accepted the Miz's match, uh, rematch for Raw, and, uh, you, I don't know if you guys saw this, um, on TV, but, uh, LA Knight did a move where he did, like, basically a reverse boss and crab, which was cool, so definitely recommend checking that out, so that was good stuff, um, also on SmackDown, um, AJ Styles got interviewed and basically just talked about how he's going to hurt Jimmy Uso tonight. Um, so, yeah, that was relatively good stuff. Um, then, Paul Heyman was trying to get the scoop with Adam Pearce backstage. Uh, this was after Judgment Day did their entrance. And, um... He wanted to know who the new superstar was that got traded from Raw to SmackDown. And uh, Adam Pearce says he doesn't know. That's the higher-ups that know that. Then LA Knight interrupted him. And Paul Heyman says that he's a big fan. And he basically uh, recommends that he doesn't interrupt uh, Paul Heyman again. So I don't know if that's setting up something with LA Knight getting into a feud in the bloodline at some point, which I would like. Um, and then, um, yeah... Uh, and the match gets made official for the next episode of SmackDown between, uh, The Miz and LA Knight. And then, uh, yeah, we had Judgment Day versus, it was Finn Balor and Damian Priest versus Ridge Holland and Pete Dunne. Judgment Day did a promo bragging about their tag title victory, saying that they did something that, uh, nobody in the bloodline could even do, and that's beat, uh, and take the tag titles from Kevin Owens and Sami Zayn, and they bragged about the fact uh, that the mo they're the most dominant faction in all of WWE. 
And yeah, Dominic Facio goes to talk and he gets booed. Like I think you see it on TV, but it really comes across when you're there live, like how much how badly Dominic Castillo gets booed. And uh Pete Dunham Witch Holland cut them off. They basically just uh talk smack to each other back and forth and we had a really good tag team match. It was uh very good actually. And eventually uh Fenn Balor and Damian Priest won. They won with the uh South of Heaven followed by the Coup de Gras, but it was very back and forth, really good stuff. I give that like three. Uh, that match was probably my favorite. It was actually great stuff. I'll give it like four stars. It was great stuff. Um, again, that that really helps be in there live for that. And then afterwards, um, the uh, Street Profits and Bobby Lashley confront them, and they say they're the most dominant faction in WWE. So we're probably gonna get a tag title match at some point between the Street Profits and Judgment Day, which. Kind of weird because Bobby Lashley and his faction's a heel and they're also heels, but um, honestly, it really works. So, And then they do a couple of adverts. They announce that John Cena is going to be on the Grayson Waller effect next week. Um, and they announce the LA Knight Miz match. They make that official. And they announce in two weeks it's going to be Asuka versus Io Sky for the Women's Championship, which I'm looking forward to. So that's good stuff. And then Asuka did a promo talking about how she wants to rematch and everything like that. How she never got it. They did some couple of things there that you could do live. They did the DX cam that they typically do at the live event. They announced the next live event in Boston, which is going to be December 27th. It's going to be part of their holiday tour. That's going to be a house show. I will potentially try to go to that show. And, you know, obviously if I do go to it, I'll do a video of you in it. Like I usually do. Um, so... And then they did Sign of the Night, uh, where you could do that. You had to do something else on this show, but I don't remember exactly what it was. Um, it was Sign of the Night, and then um, I believe it was like Catchphrase of the Night or something. I don't exactly remember what it was. Um, but we had the main event that took place on TV for everybody, which was AJ Styles versus Jimmy Uso. And it was really good stuff. I really enjoyed this match, it was great. Um, this might have been my match of the night. It's close between this and the tag match. But, um, during this match, Solo Sokoa and Paul Heyman watched the match. And, um, eventually, Styles still ends up winning with a phenomenal form on Jimmy Uso. And then afterwards, he's about to take off. But then he gets attacked from behind by, uh, Finn Balor and Damian Priest. And they throw him into the ring. He gets laid out by Solo Sokoa by the Samoan Spike. And that's kind of how SmackDown goes off the air. Um, I believe. And then afterwards, um, you know, uh, the sh after the show ended, Jimmy Uso laid him out one last time with the super kick. So, yeah, uh, the AJ Styles Jimmy Uso match was very good. I'll give that like three and three quarter stars. Uh, as terms of early days of Jimmy Uso as a heel, it's not working for me right now. Um, I've mentioned before, but now he's already lost it once as a heel. He's, he hasn't really had a moment where he's looked strong. I mean, I guess he looked strong last week, but that was also uh, that was also after he got punked out by Cena, but then he just lost here, so at terms of early days of Jimmy Uso being a heel, it's not good at the moment. Um, the only reason I could come up with why uh, Jimmy Uso won is maybe AJ Styles is going to be the next guy that challenges for the WWE Undisputed Universal Championship. I imagine it's going to be at the Saudi show. Um, I don't think it's going to be at Fastlane. Um, they might do um, maybe a tag match with AJ Styles teaming up. Because they did a segment, I forgot about this, backstage with uh, the club, the OC, where they were kind of upset with AJ Styles getting involved in bloodline business, and AJ Styles is upset at them for not having his back. So, seems like something's brewing there. Um, so, yeah, interesting stuff. Um... But that was the end of the SmackDown portion. The rest of the two uh, things were dark matches. Uh, the first one was Rey Mysterio and Santos Escobar versus the Street Profits. The Street Profits wrestled in suits. And yeah, they had a relatively good tag match. They dominated Santos Escobar throughout much of it. And then Rey got the hot tag. And eventually, uh, Rey beat uh, Montez Four with a 619 followed by a splash. I'm um, not going to complain about this just because it's not, you know, not like anybody saw this. And I was happy to see Rey Mysterio win. So, uh, overall, that was fine. 
Uh, I would give that match like three stars. It was good stuff. And then we had the main event of the entire night, which was Cody Rhodes versus Dominic Mysterio. Uh, very quick match. Cody Rhodes just immediately beat Dominic Mysterio. Um, Dom did get some offense in, but it wasn't very competitive. Cody hits the Cody cutter, followed by the crossroads for the win. And afterwards, he cuts a really good promo talking to Boston and everything like that. And, uh, yeah, it's good stuff. Um, and he, yeah, sent the crown home happy. So, uh, the Cody Dawn match I liked. I'll give that, like, three stars. It was cool to see Cody. And, you know, uh, everybody, he's just so over. So, it was, uh, relatively good stuff. So, that was the end of, uh, SmackDown right there. Um. My experience of SmackDown I thought was awesome. I'm going to give it an A-. minus. Um, kind of a surprise just because like um, a lot of the star power were, ma were sent over to India you know, for the superstar spectacle. So it was kind of a surprise to see uh, that this uh, was, you know, um, that this SmackDown, um, you know, had, had, a put, had a pretty good amount of stars on it. They had LA Knight. They had... Um, you know, Judgment Day, minus Rhea Ripley, because she was in India. And then um, they had uh, AJ Styles, they had Jimmy Uso, they had Solo, they had Paul Heyman. Um, so they had a lot of star power here on SmackDown. So that was relatively enjoyable. And yeah, going through my predictions real quick for SmackDown. You have LA Knight versus The Miz. I hope they can just give the LA Knight the win again. I could see them giving it to The Miz via cheating. And then they have a third match at Fastlane, but I kind of hope they just give the win to LA Knight. There's no reason for his momentum to be stalled right now. And then John Cena is supposed to be on the Grayson Wallow effect. I'm not really sure what could come of that. Um, again, I think they need to get John Cena into a storyline while during this time that he's going to be there. Um, so I kind of hope that's what comes of it. Maybe he starts a feud with maybe Grayson Waller. That'd be nice. Um, so, yeah, it'll be interesting to see what they do with John Cena. Um, and yeah, I'm not going to do predictions for the women's title match since that's not for a couple weeks. Um, so, yeah. Um, and yeah, that, we have some news, um, in the world of WWE. Um, by the way, I should mention too, there were some fans there that were doing CM Punk chants because they want CM Punk to come back to WWE. About every other match, uh, there was CM Punk chants. Um, but... Speaking of that, uh, there's reports that CM Punk wants to go back to WWE. Obviously, as everybody knows, I'll cover it more when I do Spark. CM Punk was fired from AEW for the, his actions at All In. And, yeah, he wants to go back to WWE. Um, I'm not sure how I feel about this. Um, obviously, with how his exit went with AEW and just kind of how he's been in AEW backstage and behind the scenes. I'm really not sure like how they're going to work around that. Um, I think if he is going to go back to WWE, he can't do a full-time schedule. I think it has to be very much like a part-time schedule, like uh, a Brock Lesnar, Roman Reigns type schedule, just because like uh, of how he was behind the scenes and everything like that. But um, yeah, I think it could be good stuff. Like There's a lot he could do. Um, on certain brands and everything like that. I'd make him a free agent, obviously. Um, I don't know what brand he could go on, if they, uh, what what show would want him, whether that's Fox or USA Network. Um, but, again, I'm, I'm skeptical that to see a return for CM Punk. Uh, we don't know how long that could be, because, uh, obviously, this was the first time that AEW has full-on released somebody while they were with contract. Um... I know technically they've done it before. They released they released a few people during the pandemic, but they didn't hold to the speak uh, to like the contract and things just because it was the pandemic. They didn't really know what was going on. So um, yeah, be interesting to see what would what happened if CM Punk did come back. He has a lot of talent he could work with, um, but yeah, but, um, if he is going to come back, I think uh, they need to be cautious with that just because of how his run in AEW ended up being. So, be interesting to see what happens there. Um, some other fans is the Dudley Boys recently just signed Legends contracts. Um, you know, obviously, they would. this would just be like if they do a big show 
Um, I don't know if they would do another run with WWE, because obviously uh, Bubba Ray Dudley was doing basically one final run where he was showing up in Impact and the NWA. And then Devon Dudley, he was recently uh, out of contract and everything like that. I don't know. He I don't even know if he can do anything. But um, they are supposed to have a match um, at Impact during the 1,000th episode. It's already been taped. I think it's being taped today. Um, and then, yeah, um, I wouldn't mind if they came back and did another match. Maybe they could have a one-off feud with Judgment Day instance. Um, and they did, like, an occasional appearances, but... I'm happy to see the Dudley boys back in the fold with them being in uh, back in WWE now. This means that um, they can be in the WWE video games now. Um, I wouldn't complain to see Bubba Ray Dudley come back maybe and do a Royal Rumble appearance. So I'm happy to see the Dudley boys back in WWE. So, And then uh, we have some sad news. Uh, we have another passing in the WWE family. It's Jemo Adnan. Um, I'll just read the thing about it because I actually I knew about it, but I didn't really obviously know too much about it. Uh, WWE is saddened to learn that Adnan I. Classia, known to the sports entertainment world as Billy White, Wolf, uh, Sheik Adnan Ali Casey, and Jawo Adnan passed away on September 6th at 84. Uh, debuted in 1955. I'm sorry, it debuted in 1959. Ali Kalasi wrote in his biography that he was born in um, Baghdad. He had an amateur wrestling career in Iraq and attended Oklahoma State University. Beginning his career as Adnan Casey, he competed for a number of promotions under many names. Uh, he was Billy White Wolf in WWE, where he won the WWE World Tag Team Championships in 1976. He later joined WWE as Jemo Adnan. He was um, Sheik of Sheiks of Baghdad and New Japan Pro Wrestling. He was also um, Amin, Amin Win competitor and manager Sheik Adnan Al Classy in the American Wrestling Association and World Class Championship Wrestling. He headlined SummerSlam 1991 with Cole Mustafa, the Iron Sheik, and Iraq Sympathizer. Uh, Sergeant Slaughter against Hulk Hogan and Ultimate Warrior. Most recently, his Jawa R9 character appeared in WWE 2K15 and WWE 2K16. WWE extends its condolences to R9 R. Clasey's family, friends, um, and fans. Obviously, I don't really know much about him minus uh, the SummerSlam 1991 match, but obviously it's never good to see anybody pass away or anything like that, so uh, obviously very sad. Very sad time frame, you know, we've had various passions in the professional wrestling industry and just the WWE family in general, so it's just obviously a very sad passing, so, yeah, um, so, um, other, another couple of news that's relatively good, I'll end it positively, is WWE did really well in the India uh, the Superstar Spectacle event, it's, the venue sold out, they did really good in merch shows and everything like that, and the event was pretty much a success, um, they did do some matches there, obviously, um, obviously this John Cena and Seth Rollins ended up defeating, uh, Fabian Agnew and Marcel Bartel in the main event, um, Walter retained his Intercontinental Championship against Shanky, um, Drew McIntyre, Sami Zayn, and, uh, Kevin Owens defeated Jinder Mahal, and Indu Shea. Uh, Rhea Ripley retained a woman's world title against Natalia. Um, and then, I'm trying to think, there was what, there was another match there that I'm trying to remember. Oh, and uh, Braun Breaker defeated Odyssey Jones in a match there. So, uh, I wish they aired it on TV, on Peacock. They put they, they put it there just because uh, I thought it would have been good stuff, but they, they didn't. So, yeah, it is what it is. Um... But also, they did really well when it came to payback. Um, it says here, WWE payback uh, delivers records for viewership gate. Uh, WWE payback delivers records for viewership gate and merchandise. Um, WWE, this was this is from September fifth. I'm getting this on the WWE article. WWE today announced that payback, which emanated from PPG Pains Arena in Pittsburgh, became the most watched. And highest grossing 
um, payback in company history. The premium live event set new records for viewership gated merchandise. Uh, viewership for payback was up 36% versus the previous record set in 2016 uh, with 2,468 in attendance. It marked the largest gate ever for any payback, up 13% versus the prior record set in Chicago in 2016. Uh, payback was also the highest gross in WWE, WWE event ever held in Pittsburgh. In addition, Payback broke the all-time event merchandise record in partnership with special event retail partners, uh, Fanatics. Uh, merchandise sales were up uh, 182% versus the previous record set in 2017. 2023 Payback was also the most viewed social uh, payback of all time with the combined 146 million social views up 44% from the previous record set in 2020. Um, the most viewed moment across social platforms was Cody Rhodes announcing Jey Uso would be joining the Monday Night uh, Raw roster, which generated more than 7 million views across all platforms in one day, which is just absolutely great. Um, and yeah, that's basically everything uh, news-related. I can't really think of anything else I really have to uh, cover. Uh, but just really great stuff for payback, all things considered. Um, again, just WWE and just wrestling in general is, um, you know, um, yeah, just uh, really great stuff for just wrestling. Wrestling's in a really big boom period right now, which I'm happy to see. So I'm really happy to see that. But yeah, that's pretty much it, guys. I have nothing left to really talk about on WWE Aftershock. Uh, so thank you guys for watching. Uh, for a plug to promotion, uh, just check out the channel for future content coming out. I don't want to plug anything because, uh, I plugged stuff last week and it didn't happen just because of schedules being different, but thank you guys for watching this video and since this is being recorded in this past, uh, since this is being recorded in the past, I will talk to you guys in the future. Podcast has concluded. Be sure to check out more group discussion as far as WWE content is concerned. And check out more content from For the Win Productions.